Hello and welcome to another Back to Jerusalem podcast. I'm Eugene Bach, your host for this time, and I'm coming to you live on delay from somewhere within the borders of Sweden. And it's not Sweden that we're talking about today. I'm super excited just because I was reading this article and I was led down this little rabbit trail uh, that brought me to a guy by the name of Dr. George Barna, who is the director of research at a place called the Cultural Research Center at Arizona Christian University. And this was a survey about the changing of American worldview as it pertains to Christians and the influence that Christians, or the lack of influence rather, uh, that Christians might have. And, and this is an American setting, but even for us that work in the Middle East and Asia and Africa, I thought that this is indicative to uh, the, the rest of the Western world. And when I say Western world, those that have been influenced by the Western world as well. I mean, we're seeing the same thing in Singapore, Hong Kong, and Western Europe, where I'm at right now. And so I... I Asked Dr. George if he would be able to come on and join us. Dr. George, are you there? I'm here. Thank you so much for joining us. It's uh, I, I'm, I've been looking forward to this this conversation for a while. In fact, I was really worried because uh, yesterday I was I was on a flight from uh, Warsaw to Frankfurt, and uh, and I was supposed to just catch a flight in Frankfurt back home to Stockholm, and. Uh, <laughs> I had had I had beef tartar just before I got on the plane in Warsaw, and it was not the best beef tartar, which is uncooked beef for those of our listeners that are that are listening. And um, yeah, I I could not I did not trust myself to get on that second flight, so I had to spend the night in Frankfurt last night, and I just <laughs> made it home about an hour ago to kind of set up the recording stuff. I was thinking about calling you and saying, would it be possible for me to delay it for an hour or something like that? But I didn't want to risk it. I didn't want, I know that you're busy. I didn't want to risk interfering with your schedule. So I'm super happy. I said all that to say, I'm super happy that you're on our podcast. So thank you for joining us. Well, thank you. It's a privilege for me to do it. I appreciate your sensitivity to scheduling and whatnot, but I, I just hope you're okay. Yes, I am. Um, it passed in like an hour, but like I like I said, I don't want to go into detail for the for the sake of of everybody else listening to this podcast. But I did not trust myself to get on that plane for two and a half hours. And by the way, I mean right now flights, especially in Western Europe, elbow to elbow, over two hundred people in a metal tube of an airplane, um, <laughs> and front to back, side by side, packed in there, not one single seat. Available, so I had a middle seat. So I definitely did not trust myself yesterday being in a middle seat. Uh, but you, I when when I just reading a little bit of research, I would rather you do you know your own introduction. But just for our audience, um, you've written more than fifty books. You're you're an an author, uh, including numerous awards and. New York Times bestseller. Um, one of the things that I saw that was sent to me by your office was that you're often referred to as the most quoted person in Christ the Christian church today. That, I mean, that's pretty amazing. Could you just give a, a, an introduction of who you are, Dr. George, and, and what it is that you do? Well, I'm sure the introduction I give would be different if you asked my children or grandchildren. But, <laughs> uh, you, you know, professionally, at least, what I can say is that I've been privileged to be called by God to use survey research, public opinion surveys, to try to understand what people believe and how they live. And so I've been doing this for almost 40 years now, and one of the, the things that I kind of specialize in, I guess you would say, is the intersection of faith and culture, trying to understand how people's beliefs about a deity, how people's beliefs about truth, how people's beliefs about sacred literature, all of these kinds of things and more, how that influences the choices that they make from moment to moment, the kind of world that they're trying to create through those choices, how they see themselves, their own personal identity, as it's wrapped up in their relationship with or their beliefs about or their understanding of the different types of, of deities or divinity. And uh, so putting all that together and trying to make sense of the world and our place in it and what we can do to make the world a better place. My personal inclination is Christianity, and so I 
I do believe in God, the God of the Scriptures, the, the Christian Bible. I do believe in Jesus Christ and, and all the things that are taught in the Scriptures, so that's my perspective. But one of the things that I work really hard at is trying to be as honest and objective as possible about what the data actually reports. And so I'm not trying to put a happy face on Christianity. I'm not trying to say that the church in America, which is primarily what I study, is the solution to everything, because actually the data show that's not the case. Most Christians in America do not really live a truly Christian life. Most Christians in America do not believe the things that are taught in the Bible in uh, to the degree that they would take those principles and apply them in their own life. And as a researcher, as a sociologist, I, I would say it's important to understand that you do what you believe. And so if you tell me you believe something but your behavior doesn't reflect it, I would argue you don't really believe it, because if you did, you'd act upon it. So I'm trying to use the research to, to keep people's eyes open, their ears open, their minds open to discovering what I believe is God's truth for us, his best for us, and uh, knowing that we have a ways to go to get there. Yeah, I, I really appreciate the stuff that you've written, because like you said, I can see that it is data-driven. I can see that there is a desire for a true picture to be painted. Uh, and and one of the one of the things that led me, I was I was reading a specific release that you did. It was it was a, a survey about the perception of sin and salvation uh, in the U.S. Christ, or in the U.S. today, and it you know gave a lot of data about uh, American Christianity and uh, and how. Uh, that is shaping the world view. And one of the reasons why I think I was specifically attracted to this article is because I, even though I'm not putting data out there, I'm an observer, right? So I, I spend a lot of time observing. I spend a lot of time working in North Korea and traveling to South Korea, traveling to North Korea. And I see a, a culture that is pretty similar in history, pretty similar linguistically, uh, all put on this peninsula. So geographically, they're kind of condensed in a, in a relatively small area. And in the, right down the middle, you have a line that basically divides two groups of people that are almost culturally identical. But one side has a worldview that has been uh, radically transformed by the Bible. And then you have another side that I would argue that the worldview has been radically transformed by uh, Marxist ideology. And uh, that might be a very simplistic way of looking at it, but I can see some of the information that you share about the American church. And I know this might sound a, 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 like a, a big jump, a big leap um, to, to compare those three nations, South Korea, North Korea, and the U.S. But as you talked about uh, American Christians or Americans in general having less and less of a worldview shaped by the Bible, uh, I can see a lot of characteristics that are at least on, if not there, at least on its way to becoming something very similar to what we see in North Korea. And again, I know that's a huge statement to make, and I'm not necessarily saying that America is going to become North Korea, but that lack of biblical worldview that you kind of pointed to in your research is what kind of drew me to uh, the article and, and led me to call you. Um, the, the specific article that I saw was the, like I said, the Perceptions of Sin and Salvation Survey, where you had, or, or a team, I'm assuming, I, I would love to hear more about how this, how, how you were able to arrive uh, at the, your conclusions and what data you had to process, but um, it, in the article I was reading that more and more Americans, uh, Americans that identify as Christians, by the way, uh, do not necessarily have a worldview perspective that's shaped by the Bible. And that has a lot of different implications in the way that in, in the way that that looks as they live their lives. Can can you just share a little bit about this particular study? Sure. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's kind of the uh, hallmark study that we do at the Cultural Research Center, 
trying to identify what percentage of American adults has a biblical worldview, uh, because that's one of the hallmarks of our university is that we try to ensure that every student graduates from the school with a biblical worldview. So we break it down into components. We, be, we believe that uh, biblical truths and principles need to be incorporated into every dimension of our life. This is not just about religion or faith or spirituality. It affects family, it affects economics, it affects governments and politics, it affects uh, our views on and, and activities related to science and everything else. So this is a study that gives us a sense of what do Americans believe and what do they do with those beliefs. And one of the, the chief conclusions that comes from it in this year's uh, version of the study, we discovered that only 6% of the adults in America possess a biblical worldview. Now wow. that's based on asking 51 different questions about beliefs and behavior that relate to biblical principles and lifestyles and values and morals. And and so we, we you know, ask all those questions and then we slice and dice the data and put people in the different categories, even though they may not even know what the categories are or, you know, where, where they would stand in terms of those. What we discover is that a huge proportion, even of people who would be what might be termed born-again Christians, and by that I don't mean, mean people who call themselves that, but people who, based on their theology, might be considered to meet the biblical criteria of born-again, meaning that they believe in the God of the Bible, they consider themselves to be a follower of Christ, and they believe that when they die, they will experience eternity in the presence of God, the Creator, Ruler, God, only because they've confessed their own sins and have accepted Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior of their life. If we classify those people as born-again Christians, regardless of how they describe themselves, first of all, they represent one out of three Americans, 33% of adults in this country. But when we look just at that sect, at that 33%, what we found is that slightly less than one out of every five of them, just 19% of that 33%, possesses a biblical worldview. So wow. while the pastors of Christian churches in America would tell us, oh, you know, the born-again people, you know, sometimes they're referred to as evangelicals, you know, they are the backbone of the church. They're the real church. Well, what our survey is showing, this tracking study, national tracking survey we do, is showing is that even four out of five of those people do not get it. They're really not living and thinking biblically. And so when we hear news reports and, and we hear commentaries and questions are raised about, you know, why is America the way it is? Where is the church in the middle of all of this? I would say it's because the church is not really being the church. It doesn't possess the mind of Christ. It doesn't have an identity, as, as Paul certainly and Jesus described in the scriptures, of being devoted followers of Christ who are living their life to imitate Christ, uh, that, that we're really dropping the ball here. And what do you think, I mean, what does that, I mean, I, maybe this goes outside of the scope of, of your study, I'm not sure, but what do you think, what, what does that mean? I mean if, if, if such a small percentage of American Christians have a biblical worldview, what does that mean? mean for the next generation, the generation after that? Uh, what what will that mean for our moral code? Uh, and I say our, you know, as, as, an, as an American, um, or I, I share citizenship with Americans, uh, but what does that mean for the culture of Americans? Uh, what does that mean for the laws of Americans? What does that mean for, you know, the future generations? You know, the United States is an interesting place. Uh, a, a number of the founding fathers wrote documents at the time that the nation was started back in the, in the 1700s and, and, and even in the years before that as they prepared to break away from England and become uh, the United States. Well, 
they, many of them wrote that this is this is an experiment in democracy, and this country is only going to work if it's populated by moral people, people who embrace the truths that are laid out in the Bible. And of course, the, the driving reason why America was started was that people left Britain so that they weren't under the religious tyranny, if you will, of the crown in, in, in England. They wanted a place where they could worship God freely. They could live biblically as they it tried to make the Bible very real and practical in their lives. But consequently, they knew that this whole experiment was going to fall apart if we don't have people who are buying into the moral foundations which the Bible provides. And so that's what we face in America today, where you've got an enormous number of people in this country who do not believe that the Bible is true. They do not believe that it's trustworthy. They do not believe that it speaks to the issues that modern human beings face. Uh, they do not believe that anybody can tell them what is right or wrong, that anyone has that authority. So, yeah, this is a turning point for America. And, and the practical implications are, number one, those people who do have a biblical worldview are what the Bible would call a remnant of God's people. They are a small percentage of the population, but what distinguishes them is their heart, their mind, and their soul geared toward knowing, loving, and serving God. They are devoting themselves to trying to do that to the best of their ability, and in concert with the unique calling they understand God to have given to them. And so this is the time when that small percentage of people has to be true and faithful and willing to fight, you know, what the Apostle Paul would call the good fight, knowing that the power of God will, will bring them through the difficult times and enable his will to be done. Secondly, what it means is that if we're going to change the fact that only 6% of American adults has a biblical worldview, then we've got to be prioritizing the worldview development of our children. Because my research has shown that a person's worldview starts developing typically somewhere between 15 to 18 months of age and is almost fully formed by the age of 13. So you've got roughly a 12-year window in which that worldview is shaped. Whether you're a part of it or not, that worldview is going to be shaped because everybody needs a worldview to get by from moment to moment. It's, it's the operating system for a human being. It's the thing that helps us to make every decision that we make based on how we understand and interpret the world what we think our place in that world is, what kind of a person we want to be, what we think our role in the world is going to be. All of these kinds of things are part of that worldview, as well as how we determine right from wrong, good from bad, appropriate from inappropriate, and so forth. So shaping that worldview... And on that note, uh, Dr. George, just really quick, I just want to add something, because what you said there, I think, is really pointed, um, especially as we see it, this kind of... Uh, same idea carried out inside of China on our side of the world where we're working at now. Uh, we have built, you know, more than a hundred different primary schools throughout Western China, and one of the apps, one of the first things we have to do. This is an absolute essential for every primary school that we build. We have to have a dedicated moral classroom. And that moral classroom uh, starts teaching children, which is which is mandatory for all children starting from the age of three inside in China. And it is the minority areas that we work in that are too poor to have their own classroom that we've been building these primary schools. But they need to have this moral classroom where children go in to learn the worldview as taught by the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, from the age of three. And of all of the church aiding activities that we do inside of China, none of those activities are as dangerous as helping with children's ministry because it is absolutely illegal. Uh, no ifs, ban buts about it. They're, they're, it's absolutely illegal to teach any children, or any child about the gospel if they're under the age of 18. And so you kind of, 
sharing this, this beginning stages of when we begin to shape a, a worldview. Uh, I think that the, the, the Chinese Communist Party know this very, very well uh, and, and know that it is important that you start the, at least from their, their side, that you start that training, uh, indoctrination, if you want to use that term, for children at that young age. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, just, I just wanted to throw that in there with what you just said as the importance of that developing stage. Well, and of course, historically, if you look at the writings of, of both Marx and Lenin, they both described how critically important it was to win over the children. Because if they had the children believing what they wanted them to believe, there wasn't going to be any pushback. There wasn't going to be any resistance to Marxist ideas and practices. And, and so that's one of the things that we're battling here in the United States is that we've had our uh, political leaders, many political leaders, most of our university professors, many of our public school teachers with younger children, and most of our media, whether it's through uh, television programs, movies, video games, music, Marxist ideas are being thrust at our young people all the time. And so they grow up very comfortable with that, believing that's the way it is. That's the way it should be. And then when you have somebody come along and share the good news of Jesus Christ with them, it's, it's a revelation to them, but it's not one that they understand. It's not one that has a context in their mind or heart, because they've been so battered by all these socialist, Marxist, communist ideas even here in the United States, even though it's not called that typically. You know, it, it, we have other names and other phrases that we use to make it more palatable. But that's exactly what's going on. So it really is the most critical battle that's going on in America today. You'll read about the things that people are trying to do to resurrect our economy after the, the, the coronavirus has wrecked it. You'll read about all kinds of other things that people are fighting for here. But the real heart of the issue is what worldview is going to dominate in America. For the first couple hundred years in America, it was the biblical worldview. But over the last 50 to 70 years, that's been under direct assault. And now we're at a turning point where Americans, particularly with this upcoming election in November, are going to have to make a choice about which way do we want to go. Do we want to be socialist, or do we want to remain, uh, you know, kind of a democratic capitalist society? Yeah, in, in the August 4th uh, release that you did uh, for this number eight kind of in your, in your survey, uh, it, it was written that it is becoming increasingly common for Christians to identify with a works-based gospel one in which a person can feel good about themselves, not because of forgiveness through Jesus Christ, but through the works that they do. And then you had listed some, some things that, uh, that show that the, the current worldview that's being embraced by so many Americans puts them at odds with biblical teaching. And those include popular beliefs like there's no moral truth, uh, the basis for truth or factors or sources other than God, Right and wrong is determined by factors other than the Bible. Uh, and these worldviews, these things, this point by point that you guys laid out in that survey, uh, these are not, these are a majority of uh, the Americans. Uh, the Bible is not the authoritative or true word of God. People are basically good. And the, the, the personal definition of success is not based on a consistent obedience to God. When, when we don't have an absolute moral truth and we look to the majority of uh, uh, Americans or the majority of our society, it, whether it be Americans or, or not, in, in any society, if we look, what, what is wrong with, with that? What, instead of focusing at, on, on this old book uh, you know, that's written over a period of uh, several thousand years, uh, instead of looking to this ancient document, but looking at modern society and allowing the majority to kind of set the standards for what is moral uh, and what is not moral, 
what 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 are some of the problems with that, or what are some what are some of the benefits? Well, certainly, I would say one of the central problems with that is that it leads people to be abundantly selfish. What we're seeing as a result of all of this in our country is that people have come to the conclusion that life is all about me. It's not about God. It's not about nation. It's not about community. It's not about family. It's about me. And as a result of that, everything that I do, every choice that I make, is made with my personal best interest in mind. I don't worry about other people. I don't worry about the consequences of my choices, except the consequences that affect me. And so it dissipates the possibility of having strong relationships, positive relationships with other people. It ultimately dissipates marriage and family, because the thinking behind selfishness goes, if I'm not happy, if I'm not happy, if I'm not satisfied, if I'm not fulfilled, if I'm not reaching my full potential, something's wrong and I've got to change that. doesn't matter who I step on to do that. doesn't matter what the outgrowths of my new choices are going to be unless they give me greater happiness, happiness and a sense of success and accomplishment and so forth. So it's, it's a very inward-looking rather than outward or maybe upward-looking perspective. And ultimately what you wind up doing is having a society that's immersed in moral anarchy, that's immersed in political chaos, and that's overwhelmed by economic competition where we don't try to help each other we really try to take advantage of and exploit each other. I mean, I think that we can absolutely see that manifested in most nations that don't have a worldview uh, shaped by the Bible. Uh, in that, I mean, it doesn't matter whether I'm in uh, communist era Ethiopia or uh, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, uh, or China. I, I absolutely see that selfishness uh, that that is a part. And, and, and most of the time that selfishness is not so much about trying to get ahead, but in a, in a, in a society where misery is being equally distributed to everyone, it's what can I do to not suffer as much? What, even if I have to give up my own family members, uh, there, there becomes this almost animalistic side. I just, I just came from Poland um, uh, yesterday and I spent some, um, an amazing time with some great believers. And they were talking about the, the kind of behavior that their country is coming out of. That, you know, it's been dark and gray and cold. And I'm talking about that this is how they're emotionally describing themselves as a people group coming out of that communism. And they, can, they notice the difference right away with you know, Western Germany, people being brighter, happier, more loving. Uh, there's, there's public displays of affection. Not that that's a necessity per se, but that is a, this, this characteristic that almost comes out of a society that is more, has a stronger biblical worldview. And, uh, and, and seeing how their, group, their small little social groups have changed socially because of their embracement of the gospel and the word of God um, coming out of that darkness uh, it really highlights exactly what you were saying. One of the things that I found interesting um, at the very beginning part of this five-page uh, uh survey that that I read was the almost kind of this lack of embracement of the idea that we are as human beings we are sinners and we need to have forget we we need to ask for forgiveness we need to be forgiven for these sins and and if I sin and no one is there to see it um, I, I, this biblical worldview would, would say, well, God sees it and that I am still uh, committed to him to not sin even when no one else is there to see it physically. 
Uh, how do you feel that that, that impacts a, a person's worldview? Well, again, it, it's a huge thing because it goes back to this selfishness. If you believe, if you even believe that there is such a thing as some kind of eternal experience, and a growing percentage of Americans do not believe that. But among those who do, what's happening is they, again, have this selfish mindset that says, well, if I'm going to have eternal salvation of some type, it's up to me to make it happen. And so their emphasis is upon their own goodness or the things that they're able to accomplish, their achievements, that would justify who they are and how they live and what kind of eternal experience they may have. That's compared to the Christian perspective, the biblical perspective, that says that, listen, your, your judgment will be by your Creator. Your Creator is just, but He's also holy. And so you're never going to meet up to His standard. And so he's made a provision for you, and that's what Jesus did by dying on the cross. But you have to have that relationship with him, where because of that relationship, he will represent you before that holy, righteous, and just uh, uh, judge, you know, come judgment time. And so we've got most Americans now, or, or excuse me, a plurality, who would say, no, it has nothing to do with Jesus. It just has to do with me. If I do enough good, I'll be able to take care of myself. And the really disturbing part about that is when we look at the people in America who call themselves Christians, that's about 7 out of 10 people here, uh, people 18 and older. Of those, 7 out of 10, a majority believe that their eternal consequences are wrapped up in their own works or their own personal goodness, not on the work of of Jesus on the cross. So even within the Christian Church in America, we've really lost our perspective. Can can you give me uh, an idea how you know what 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 does your team look like? And and when you guys go out to do this kind of research, can you just kind of give us a brief thumbnail sketch of what that looks like when you are going after this data? Yeah, I mean, it'll start out by developing, as social scientists are wont to do, a series of hypotheses about what we think is happening in people's lives, and the research is there to test the hypotheses. So we then, based on that, develop a questionnaire. We take that questionnaire and we test it to make sure that it's communicating what we think it's communicating, it's measuring what we want it to measure, uh, you know, we want it to be as objective as possible, as, as uh, reflective as possible of the population that we're studying. Then we have to develop the sample, that is, the population that we want to measure. We have to figure out how do we get a group of people who adequately represents that large population. In the United States, we've got 255 million people who are 18 or older. And, I'm, you know, we do this survey with a sample of 2,000 interviews. So we've got to make sure that we've got a way of, of identifying people in the population such that they will represent that, that larger population from which they were drawn. We then conduct the interviews with those people. Uh, they last about 15 minutes on average because in this nation right now, that's about as long as people are willing to give you for a survey. So that's about, I think we had uh, 66 questions, 69 questions maybe, in, the, in this survey. That's what we were able to cover during the 15 minutes. Then we come back, we put all their answers into a computer program that enables us to tabulate that in a, in a, in a data form that we can read and where we can begin to compare different types of people and their answers. So I might want to look at how men differ from women, how Christians differ from Muslims, how young people differ from older people, maybe how one political group differs from another political group in their answers. And so then I will analyze all of that information and write it up in these little mini-reports, such as the one that you read, the five-pager, 
ultimately we'll have a much larger report that puts all of the data from the survey into you know what will probably be a, a hundred page report but we try to break it up into bite-sized pieces so that every couple of weeks when I put one of these out people can read it and get their arms around it and then two weeks later we'll give another piece to the puzzle and hopefully at the end of the process they'll see how all the pieces fit together. Uh, let me let me ask. I mean, because I mean, you're working with data and numbers, and and you're in an academic setting uh, with you know fellow academics and and aspiring uh, those that are you know working on their degrees. Was there anything in when, when you you start looking at you know the the different points? Uh, was there anything that jumped out, or or something specifically that kind of took you by surprise that you're like? Holy cow, I did not see this one coming. Well, I mean, there, there are a number of things that, you know, I sat back and said, whoa, look at that. Um, you know, one of those was the fact that so few people believe that the Bible is truly God's Word and therefore trustworthy. Only four out of ten Americans fit that uh, characterization today. The fact that 98% of the people in this country who say they would prefer socialism to capitalism, 98% of them do not have a biblical worldview. Um, uh, you know, the, those types of things. The fact that two out of three people who describe themselves as Christians say that it really doesn't matter what faith you choose as long as you have some faith. I mean, these are the kinds of things that keep me up at night. <laughs> it's like, whoa, we are so far off track. The fact that six out of ten people in this country say there's no such thing as absolute moral truth. That yeah, I mean, truth is relative. Yeah, when, when you said, you know, it, it's not important which faith you have, just that you have a faith. When I read that section, I'm like, what? I mean, no, it, it absolutely, I mean, not all faiths are created equal. I, that's one of the reasons right. why we spend so much time working in Muslim-dominated areas, in Hindu-dominated areas, in Buddhist-dominated areas, in atheist-dominated areas, because the people suffer. The societies suffer, the nations suffer under these rules. And I know that that's not a popular thing to say, but all reli it's, 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 it's not you know, the, the best thing in the world if you just have a religion. One of the things that absolutely blew me away when I was reading was that 8% you know, of those that you had documented, had, that when talking about death, they believe in some sort of reincarnation. I was like, 8%? I went and I, I looked it up to kind of see, you know, well, what is the percentage of, 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 of Buddhists and Hindus in America? And you're talking about less than 1%, like 0. 0.5, 0. 0.4%. And so I was like, wow, that's, that's, a, that's a huge influence that uh, somebody has had uh, in, the Amer in, in, in America for them to have that high a number percentage-wise of people that believe in reincarnation. Well, and that's one of those instances where you can see the influence of the media, because there are a lot of TV shows, a lot of movies, there's a lot of music that regularly uses Eastern concepts to explain what's going on in the plot, or, you know, or the theme of whatever it is that they're communicating to the audience. And so, you know, ideas like karma and reincarnation, those things are common now in American society. You know, well, in my next life, you know, I will blah, blah, blah. And so people are becoming more comfortable with that, so comfortable that, you know, when, when that number, and that was one that jumped out at me, uh, I went back to my research from about 30 years ago, and at that point, only 2% of Americans believed in reincarnation. So it's quadrupled in a pretty short period of time, which again shows this kind of drip, drip, drip influence of the media on what we think and how we live. Yeah, I did. A, I, we just came out with a book this year called Leaving Buddha, where I spent some time. There's a guy that I now work with. His name is Tenzin. He was a, one of the top lamas uh, in his area, the top lama at his monastery. He studied directly under the Dalai Lama. When we began to write the details of his personal story, 
uh, there were so many people when they read that story, they're like, no way. No, Buddhism is a peaceful religion. So when they hear about, you know, uh, Tenzin being beaten by fellow monks that want him dead because he converted, you know, to be a Christian, uh, that was thought to be, that, that's odd. That doesn't seem like the, the peaceful, loving uh, Buddhism, Hindu, New Age kind of, you know, ideas that we have learned from our yoga class or from my Hollywood movies or movie stars that are very influential. But there, there was one part as well that, uh, for me personally, the, the, it was the most striking. I think this is the, the, this is the final part that I would love to kind of hear your take on. Because uh, I, I know that you're busy, really appreciate your time. But one of the things that kind of that hit me was the lack of desire for modern day North American Christians to share their faith with others. Well, this was one of those areas that we've seen coming for a long time because that's that's in process, as they say. Uh, Forty years ago when I started doing this, it was assumed that if you were a follower of Christ, you would be looking for opportunities to share the good news of what Jesus had done in your life with other people. The whole reason that, that we have it, or one of the, the key reasons why we have our faith in Christ is so that we can share it with other individuals and, and they can experience the joy of knowing Him and knowing eternal salvation as well. But over the course of these last 40 years, there has been a very constant and consistent decline, first of all, in the percentage of uh, Christians in this country who would say that they have any kind of a personal responsibility to be sharing their faith in Christ. Secondly, we've seen a decline in their understanding of how to go about doing that. Thirdly, there's been a decline in their intentionality of developing relationships with people who are not Christian so that we might have opportunities to not only model for them what Christianity looked like, but then to answer their questions about what Christianity is. And then you look at our churches, and back 40 years ago, it was a big deal for churches to have an evangelistic ministry. People would go out and share their faith. People were taught how to share their faith. There was preaching about the importance of sharing your faith. That's not the case in America anymore. Everything has become privatized. It's all about the individual and him or her getting what he or she needs, rather than us thinking about, we're here as servants of the living God. Our responsibility is to give what's been given to us, old Genesis 12 principle of you're blessed to be a blessing. But we've lost that. Now we believe that if someone else is blessed, we want to get the same thing they have. I'm, 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 uh, you know, I'm almost positive. I could be wrong, but you know, after you and your team are looking at this data, you're processing it. Um, what, what has been some of the conversations you guys have had about how can we change this trend, or what needs to happen rather to change this trend? Well, I think you know we're in this all the time, so it's not like this is a, a brand new revelation to us. I've been doing this for 40 years, I've been tracking the trends, reporting on the trends, so I, you know, we kind of know what's going on. But, when you get a data set like this and you sit back and you review it, really the first reaction is a stunned silence of, oh my goodness, this is incredible, it's almost overwhelming. And then the second reaction is, but this is why we rely upon God. We don't do this in our own strength. Mm. We need the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us in this. We can't do this alone. Nobody can do this alone. No single group can do this alone. This is why the Church at large needs to be engaged in this battle. It's an enduring spiritual battle. So, you know, I mean, that, that's the perspective that we have to take on this. But then thirdly, we recognize what a blessing it is that God has allowed us to do this kind of research and to share it with the Church at large so that we can make intentional and strategic choices about what are we going to do about it. We can answer the so what question 
with greater knowledge about where we stand, what needs to happen, and what some of the, the, the tactics are that we may want to use to raise that 6% who have a biblical worldview to a much higher figure. God doesn't even need 6% to change our culture. But with the 6% here serving as a remnant that he can call upon, we have all that we need to do what God has called us to do. Through Christ and through the Church itself, acting together, doing what biblical principles instruct us to do, and following the calling that he's given to each of us uniquely as we work together, we can do what needs to be done. You know, I, some of the things that we've been talking about are, are things that you kind of hear generically thrown around quite a bit. I mean, I think a lot of people have a feel. They just can't put numbers or, or data behind what they, they, they feel that they're seeing in their sphere, on TV, in their social settings. And what th your studies, what your information uh, that you've put out there does, at least for me, is uh, opens my eyes to what the real situation is. And more than just you know a feeling here or there or observation here and there, this, this, this really helped kind of uh, break things down in, in a way that was easier for me to digest. And I really appreciate that. If there are listeners that are, that are downloading this podcast and, and listening, to what you're saying, they want to know more, where's the best place for them to go to read more of your materials, find, to, to go through more of your research or get access to your books? Yeah, well, there are a couple places they could go. One certainly is culturalresearchcenter.com. That's the site associated with the Arizona Christian University Research Center that we have that, that's conducting all this research. And so every two weeks I put a new research-based report on that website that people can download, they can pass it around, uh, you know, they can write in with questions, I mean, you know, whatever they want. So that's free, and we hope that people take advantage of that. I also put all those reports and other things that I'm writing and, and some of the books that I've written, those are available on my website at georgebarna.com. And, uh, you know, of course, again, they, they can get in contact with me and ask questions and whatnot. Uh, this really is meant to be helping us grow in our understanding of what God's called us to do in this world to advance His agenda, not ours. So I'm grateful for the opportunity to share this with your audience. Yeah, thank you so much. So again, I highly, I, this is definitely going to be a place I usually spend the first two, three hours of my day just going through all these different sites. Uh, I'm adding these two to my list culturalresearchcenter.com or georgebarna.com. Both of those websites will have materials that Dr. George puts out there. Dr. George, this has been a huge, huge blessing. I want to thank you for your time. I hope that I can contact you and bring you back on again because I, I, there were other things that I just got a chance to glimpse at that I would love to dig deeper in and, and just have a couple of minutes to pick your brain and, and try to, you know, learn more about the, the, the stuff that you're putting out there that helps us understand so much. So yeah, thank you. Thank you, Eugene. I appreciate it. I, I appreciate the work that you're doing. And if this helps in it, I mean, that's the blessing to me. So I look forward to helping you anytime I can. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. George Barnett. God bless you, brother. Thank you. Thank you. I love it when we get an opportunity to listen to someone like Dr. George that has dedicated his life to finding information about what our current battlefield looks like. My background being in the United States military, serving two tours in the Persian Gulf, it would be insane for us to arrive at the battlefield and not have a map drawn up of where the enemy's entrenchments are, where the, their mobile units, where their supply points, where their routes, where their command and control center, where their admin, you know, all of those things. And the more information that I have, the, the more effective I will be on the battlefield. 
If I just go attacking an army not knowing uh, the size, not knowing the strength, not knowing the equipment, uh, not having any of that information would be absolute suicide. So I really feel the information that, that Dr. George Barna has put out there is it's, it's, ap it's absolutely essential for Christians. It's, it's always great um, to you know, listen to pastors talk about what we need on the battlefield. It's always great to be encouraged by testimonies of other people that are going into the trenches and hooking and jabbing with the enemy. But, <laughs> you know, I, my background, as most people that have been listening to this podcast for a while, you'll know that being, for me, being an infantry first, then becoming a scout sniper in the Marine Corps, then moving into intelligence during the last part of my, my service, it was essential. It was an essential part of my job as, as a scout sniper to not just go in. I mean, when people think of scout snipers, right? They think of someone that goes into the field and you hunt men. And that's kind of what we pride ourselves on. We, we uh, above the, the doors to our school, uh, said there is no hunting like the hunting of men and those that have done it long enough care for nothing there. Uh, those that have done it long enough and enjoy it care for nothing else thereafter. That's kind of what scout snipers are known for, is hunting people. But that's actually the smallest part of our job. The biggest part of my job is a scout sniper. Because we work in the smallest allowable units in the United States military, two-man teams. It's one of the reasons why we call Marine, in the Marines, we call them scout snipers and not snipers. In the Army, you call them snipers because they're designated marksmen that attach themselves to infantry units. Marine Corps scout snipers are different. There's no other unit like them. Scout snipers in the SEALs are attached to a SEAL team. Or, or snipers, the SEALs are, go through scout sniper school, but they're attached to a, a SEAL team. And uh, I went through Army Ranger School, and Army Ranger School shares this, or at least during the time that I did in Fort Benning, uh, it's in the same place as the, as the sniper school. Uh, for the U.S. Army, which is like, I think it was two weeks long or something uh, back in the 90s, where ours is like two months long. But they, you are a designated marksman in the Army. That's why you're called a, a sniper, an Army sniper. But in the Marine Corps, you're called a scout sniper because you work in two-man teams. And because you're such a small team, because you're such a small unit, you get eyes on the enemy. And so one of the things that we had to do a lot of this before, you know, we had camera phones and stuff. We had to do a lot of drawing. I don't know if they still teach that in sniper school or not, but one of the things you had to do is get good at drawing. And you had to draw to scale. And you had to make maps from your hide of the area that's in your firing sector. So anything that you saw, you tried to draw it the best that you could. And you were graded on your ability to draw in sniper school. And then when you came back to Intel... You shared that. And when you are a platoon, I was the, I was, I, I eventually became platoon sergeant for our scout sniper platoon in battalion 3-1. And one of my jobs was to bring in information from the field. That's kind of when I decided, you know, I'm, I, God has called me on because I wasn't an office guy. I loved being out in the field. It hurt so bad to be sitting in Intel, Processing information, hearing the guys out in the field having a grand old time, enjoying themselves, doing what I wanted to do, what I love to do. And now, you know, I was stuck back in Intel um, processing information. But without that information, it's impossible to have effective battle. I think the same is true in the spiritual world. Without having the proper information, your prayers are not effective. Your efforts are not effective. Your focus is not effective. As effective, not as effective. Like uh, Dr. George had pointed out, you know, this is all on God's strength. We rely upon Him. What, what we are unable to do, we can do through Christ. But when He gives us information and lays it at our, our feet for free, as we see that we have with Dr. George, it is imperative that we make the most of it of what God has gifted us with. I want to thank you so much for joining us for this Back to Jerusalem podcast. Again, I'm Eugene Bach, your host for this time, and I'm coming to you live on delay from somewhere within the borders of Sweden. God bless you.